And I bid you all grace, mercy, and peace once again from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It is Monday, June the 22nd, year of our Lord, 2020. And we're continuing to read through Henry Hamann's On Being a Christian. Uh, we are coming to the end of chapter two. We'll plunge ahead a little bit into chapter three today. And again, if you haven't been following this so far, what Haman has laid out in his personal confession of faith, he says that you know he believes that all human beings, in a way that just doesn't need to be argued for, have some sort of belief that there's more after our death, that we don't just die, that's it. And he says then as a corollary to that belief that there's something more than just death and that's the end, is that everyone basically there's, there's some sort of God out there. Uh, again, religions will differ wildly on that, but that there is a God, he says, is axiomatic. You don't really need to argue for it. He, but then he goes on to say the more interesting question is not whether or not there's a God, but what is that God's attitude toward you? What, what's his disposition? And that allows him then to get to the Christian answer to that question, which is that God justifies you, God justifies me. And he talked a little bit about what justification means, the, shows mercy, has grace, forgives. And then the last section that we looked at was, what is it that God justifies? What is it that God forgives? And that's the issue of human sin. And he took exception with those Christians who say, oh, the only people who can really understand how sinful human beings are are people who confess this by faith through the scriptures. He says, look, secular humans know that uh, human beings are pretty sorry a lot, that, that we do all sorts of terrible things, that, that no one uh, is without fault. And he would point to some great posts and great literature. And, and then he also was quite uh, pointed about saying, look, and people who say that, oh, everyone's basically searching for God and we've got a God-shaped hole in our heart, he said, okay, there's a fundamental level at which that's true, but the surface level at which people talk about that couldn't be less true because you can see time and time again, all sorts of people vehemently attacking uh, the idea of the Christian God that is set forth within the scripture. So uh, that's where we're at. So we are up to God justifying sinners. This is still in chapter two. And we pick up. The human being, as biblically described, this evil, wicked, sinful monster whose total potential for self-excellence is turned to base, ignoble ends, this rebel against God, this enemy of the good creator, this is the one whom God justifies, whom God, by a solemn judicial verdict, declares to be right before him. It is this sinful being whose sins are taken away. It is this rebel who is called to be a child and heir. It is this enemy whom God seeks and reconciles to himself. In all cases, it is human beings as they are. That is why St. Paul says that God justifies, quote, the ungodly, not the good and noble and righteous and godly. And this same thought Jesus uttered well before Paul, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance, and that's Matthew 9, 13. This justification of the ungodly surely turns all normal standards of right and wrong, of justice and injustice, of law and order upside down. It is more than a mystery or paradox. It seems almost midsummer madness, but so says the gospel and so says the Lutheran. This is the only way you can be saved. If you don't want to be saved as a sinner by a free and judicial verdict of God, you cannot be saved at all, and you will perish in your sins. However, it must now be shown how God can act in this unheard of fashion. How can God remain holy and just in himself and at the same time grant free and full forgiveness to the rebellious sinner? To answer that, we must now speak about Jesus Christ. Chapter 3. God for me in Jesus Christ. From the very beginning of Christianity, Christians have held that Jesus is both God and man in one person. In the Apostles' Creed, the church confesses Jesus Christ to be, quote, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. The so-called Nicene Creed of Anno Domini 381 expands somewhat on the divine nature of Jesus Christ and declares concerning him that he is, quote, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, 
of one substance with the Father, through him all things were made. Lutherans have made these ancient confessional statements part of their own Lutheran confessions, repeating these statements in the old creeds in approximately the same form in the Augsburg Confession and in the Small College Articles, and expanding on the personal union between the divine and the human at length in the Formula of Concord in two articles, Article 7 on the Holy Supper and Article 8 on the Person of Christ. The Incarnation, that is, that God became flesh, a human being, in Jesus of Nazareth, is completely an unfathomable mystery. As such, it has naturally been repeatedly attacked and rejected down the centuries by people within the church, as well as by people outside of it. However, denial of the Incarnation puts a person outside the Christian church. I have no intention of debating the matter here, but it is worth pointing out that to deny that the man Jesus of Nazareth was at the same time truly God in the one person does not eliminate the difficulty of understanding the person of Jesus. You may get rid of one difficulty, only to come up against another. Who is Jesus Christ? If Jesus of Nazareth was or is not true God, what are we to make of his many sentences that imply he was divine or that directly make that assertion? Sentences like the following come to mind. Quote, all things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. That's Matthew 11, 27, 28. I am the light of the world, John 8, 12. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. That's John 10, 17, 18. I and the Father are one, John 10, 30. Most striking of all the examples probably is Jesus' reply to a demand of his disciple Philip. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Believe me when I say that I am the Father and the Father is in me. That's John 14, 8 through 11. What sort of person can this Jesus be that he speaks in this way? If he was not God, he was quite, quite mad. But then as many sentences, like the Sermon on the Mount and also many others besides, do not give the impression of madness at all, but of quite exceptional wisdom. Was Jesus then a devil of the deepest dye, a matchless hypocrite, one who clothed the most shameful lie, I and the Father are one, in the cloak of profound spiritual wisdom? One could, of course, get rid of all the difficulty by taking a completely negative, critical line. One could deny that Jesus ever said anything approaching the sentences that have been cited, deny that he ever made any claim which suggested that he was more than an ordinary human being. One could insist that after his death, his followers invented all these claims and assertions about him. One could do this by rewriting all the records concerning him, chiefly the four Gospels, on the basis of a, of a strong personal and biased point of view, without any shred of support in the written materials of the infant church. One must be aware of doing this, however, that one is engaged in an activity that only can be called illegitimate elimination of historical evidence. Others less critical might say, granted that Jesus was born, say, in 4 BC, and died in AD 30, and has risen to be with the Father as God and man eternally, and is who the Christian creeds assert, what are we to say about his life, death, and resurrection? What well, was the work that he accomplished? With some simplification, it may be said that there are three main ways in which the life of Jesus has been assessed. And we'll pick that up tomorrow. Until then, God's blessings be with you all, Peace to you in Christ. Amen.